Ember is an isometric real-time with pause fantasy RPG developed by a small studio and originally released on PC in 2016 and Nintendo Switch in 2020. Now it has arrived on Xbox One, and while it doesn't have the same depth and production value as the games it seems inspired by, it's one well worth considering for fans of classic real-time with pause RPGs. Stick around and I'll explain. I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. I've spent over Five hours now playing Ember through backward compatibility on Xbox Series X, and I want to thank the developer for providing me with the review code to check it out. I'm a big fan of real-time with pause RPGs like Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, Neverwinter Nights 1 and 2, Icewind Dale, Dragon Age Origins, and more recently, Pillars of Eternity. Despite turn-based being more common, I really do prefer real-time with pause, and typically dial the difficulty down to easy to enjoy light yet meaningful tactical decisions in in a supervisory capacity rather than that of a micromanager, while watching combat play out at a nice pace, mostly in real time. And while I do love this type of game, I also greatly prefer to play on gamepad rather than mouse and keyboard. So even though I actually bought Ember on PC years ago, I couldn't bring myself to play more than a few minutes of it and resolve to wait and hope for it to come to consoles, which I was happy to see finally happen here. Uh, now, compared to most of those other games that I mentioned, Ember is much simpler in its combat, largely due to how combat skills are handled. Instead of combat abilities being on a skill tree that you unlock over time, they're bound to the equipment that you wear. And in my experience, that means you'll only have one to three skills that each party member can choose from in combat. So far, these skills do things like deal elemental damage, heal party members, or stun and silence enemies. Now, in a game like this, how you port it to gamepad can make all the difference in how enjoyable the game actually is. I loved the original Pillars of Eternity, which I thought did gamepad control wonderfully, but couldn't play more than a few hours of Pillars 2 because of some awkward and cumbersome choices made in the gamepad controls. I am happy to say that with just a little bit of getting used to, Ember's controls became pretty natural for me. You control your party leader, predictably using the left stick, and your other party members follow your leader, exploring environments. Objects and NPCs are highlighted and auto-targeted for interaction with the A button uh, based on where you face. This works great almost all of the time with only a few recurring moments here and there that I've had troubling, uh, trouble targeting the specific object I want to interact with. That usually happens when it's part of a, a larger cluster of interactable objects. And each combat ability is mapped to a different face button, uh, making them very easy to trigger in combat. So far, I have a max of three party members total, with my main starting character being the default that I control. But holding the left or right trigger will allow me to momentarily take control of another party member to have them heal, attack, use an item or an ability. And all those things are, as I said, really easy to trigger because of the face buttons, but you can at any time uh, just click that, uh, that right bumper button to go into pause tactical mode, choose your... Uh, your moves and then restart real-time combat again. The up button on your directional cross pad is used to cycle through enemies when you're selecting them for combat. The other three directional buttons are quick slots you can attach inventory items to. Combat is pretty straightforward and for me on the easy difficulty setting seems to mostly be about weighing mana cost over ability benefit while factoring in my remaining number of health and mana restoring consumables. In the opening hours of the game I played on normal difficulty, but was having to pause and select specific actions more often than I wanted to. On normal difficulty, you definitely need to take advantage of combat abilities, combat healing items, non-combat crafting of restorative meals, and the resting system if you want to survive. Less so of all those things on easy difficulty, but you still can't ignore them. Party members join you with a predetermined class like warrior or wizard, as I've run into so far. Your main character is just called a light bringer and is, you know, has some special abilities, but mostly you're still operating as a, a regular class type that you would choose, like a magic user or a fighter. And you just, you know, d determine what kind of character you're playing based on the equipment you choose and which stats you boost when they level up and you have a, a few stat points to spend. 
I've run into a single lockpick, but not any especially roguish skills so far, apart from optional ranged weaponry and accompanying skills, if that counts. So non-combat skills such as sneaking or charisma don't seem to be uh, a part of this game so far. Now, I'm still early in the game, and so I have no idea how complicated things may get later in terms of status effects or other combat situations, but the developers themselves shared with me that they purposefully made a light game here. Uh, not meant to tax your brain too much, they said, and that seems to fit well when lounging on a couch with a controller in your hand. And my experience bears those comments out. But don't let the word light deter you from looking into this one if you see that as a negative. It's still a substantive game with an average playtime of 19 hours on HowLongToBeat.com. It's also described by, described by the devs as having over 70 quests with diverse gameplay, over 65 combat skills for the player to use for customized battle party strategy, more than 20 handcrafted environments and dungeons, in an, an in-depth crafting system, uh, everything from baking bread to forging magic weapons, and a dynamic weather and time of day system. Based on my own experience, I admit that the opening hours didn't grab me right away. I really hit the sweet spot at around four to four and a half hours in, when I had three party members with diverse combat abilities, and was finding or buying new gear that was valuable to their uh, particular combat roles. Both loot and leveling happened at a satisfying pace for me with an average of one to two levels gained, I would say usually just one per hour playing the game. And enemies in the overworld areas do seem to respawn, so there does seem to be opportunity to grind if you'd like to do that. And the core loop of exploring, combat, and upgrading has been pretty satisfying for me here. Now true, you don't have near as many skills at your disposal compared to other games in this genre, but in those other types of games, you know, I end up defaulting to the same few skills for each character in combat encounters anyway. And even without a skill tree, you are finding new equipment with new abilities that are better than your old ones, and so the net result feels about the same. You know, you use the same few abilities all the time until they are replaced with new, better uh, go-to abilities in combat. And uh, since you can always keep alternate sets of weapons and armor in your shared inventory, if you want access to more than three skills per character while out adventuring, it's just a matter of swapping out one or more equipment items between combat encounters. The visual look of the game is unlikely to stun you as it's both a few years old and made by a small team and, and relatively small budget, but it still presents that classic D&D inspired fantasy world in a satisfying way for me. Uh, I do wish that they g gave you the ability in the menus to uh, increase the brightness level sometimes during the night cycle of the game while I'm out in the wilderness. I had trouble kind of seeing uh, what was, you know, seeing my environment. Other times it wasn't completely clear to me which objects you could, you know, pass through or move between and, and uh, which ones were just kind of like background scenery. The, the, maybe something about the contrast of the, uh, of the, the world and, and the things that are populating your environment um, could have been a little bit uh, varied for me in order to uh, navigate and, and appreciate the world a little bit better. But as I said, still very solid and serviceable D&D style fantasy visual environment. The audio does a nice job overall with the score that presents the genre and mood well and, and feels like you would expect for a game like this, even if a few tracks seem to loop just a little more frequently than I would personally like. There is some voice acting that feels totally solid to me, but you'll still be mostly reading text boxes throughout this game. And most importantly for me, it has very satisfying crunchy boots as your characters travel and explore. Now, I don't play games for story, so I won't comment much on that here. It definitely has a story and a world with an interesting history that your character is an important part of, but the world so far seems to be a greater focus than the characters, with dialogue largely being about exposition and lore so far. There also isn't really dialogue choice worth mentioning. Uh, you can choose conversation topics sometimes, but not really how you behave toward others, apart from choosing to parlay instead of uh, attacking some enemies you come across in a few kind of scripted scenarios. Uh, as always, I was on the lookout for any interesting interesting moral, philosophical, or spiritual ideas presented in the game that might trigger some worthwhile thought or conversation. Fantasy worlds are often used to make commentary on real-world religions, with Catholicism usually being a target of criticism. Uh, the main religion in this game, which is front and center as you interact with a story-centric order of monks, 
involves some kind of goddess worship. The goddess is said to be all-powerful at one point, but is also clearly finite with a definite beginning as she is presented in the lore of the game. There isn't a strong enough focus on this religion for me to be aware of any intentional themes or commentary yet, uh, but I found it interesting that a default line of some of the monks is to ask me if I've accepted the goddess into my heart. The idea of uh, accepting Christ into our hearts is a commonly expressed idea among Christians, uh, despite it technically not being a phrase from Scripture. But this is uh, much more of a Protestant or even evangelical expression rather than a Catholic one. So despite the aesthetics of a heavily structured and formal organized religion in the game, it may be the case that potential religious commentary in Ember will be focused on Protestantism in some form. Or maybe there won't be anything intended at all. It's still way, way too early to tell, but I did find that interesting. In summary, uh, $15 on the Xbox Store feels about right uh, for uh, the, 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 the content that I'm getting here so far, and um, maybe even like a bargain when all is said and done, you know, we'll see. It's not as systematically fleshed out as other games of this type, but the meat and potatoes core of why I play these kinds of games seems to all be here, and I'm looking forward to playing more. Uh, and those are all my thoughts for now on Ember for the Xbox One. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.